Uh, the presentation we're going to try and do briefly uh, this morning is to try and help you understand and appreciate the special considerations that apply when one is determining by way of an assessment whether or not someone under the age of 16 has a catastrophic impairment. The reality of the determination, as we all know, is about a $1.9 million difference between a non-cat uh, impairment and a catastrophic one for an infant. I, uh, my paper, by the way, is at tab three of the materials. I'll be referencing some legislation, some of which uh, may not be on the PowerPoint, so please feel free to turn to that for referencing. I think the first thing I'd like to do is just remind you, and it may be trite to some extent, but it's always useful to reflect back on the actual legislation that we're talking about for catastrophic impairment. When it comes to infants and the special considerations that apply, it's set out in page two of the paper, we look at section 2D of the SABs, and that's the old familiar Glasgow outcome scale of nine or less Tab 2D sub 2, the Glasgow Outcome Scale. Then, of course, we have the 55% whole person impairment in E. And we have the marked impairment or extreme impairment set out in Chapter 14 of the guides, which is F. Well, back about eight years ago, in October of 2003, there were amendments made to the SABs to give us these special considerations that we have for what I'll refer to the term as pediatric assessments. The first one is section 2.3, and take a look at it. It says that 2.4, which is the other special consideration, applies if the insured person is under the age of 16 at the time of the accident. I think the first thing you would want to note there, perhaps, is I see no restriction on the catastrophic assessment being done after the person reaches the age of 16. And it seems to me that the special considerations apply if they're under 16 at the time of the accident. So keep that in mind. It goes on, and you can read that for yourself. Let's carry on to the real special consideration there. And it says, for the purposes of Clause 2, D, E, and F, and of course we just talked about that, D is Glasgow uh, outcome and Glasgow coma scale, E is the 55%, F is the Chapter 14 uh, marked impairment. So if you're doing a catastrophic assessment of uh, someone who's uh, six, under the age of 16 at the time of the accident, and if that person can be described as reasonably be believed, and we'll come back to that phrase, to be a catastrophic impairment, they should be deemed to be the impairment that is most analogous to the impairment referred to in Clause 2D, E, and F after taking into consideration the developmental implications of the impairment. The necessity for these amendments seemed self-evident to everyone, and that's what brought them about. There was a panel uh, which uh, submitted to the government back in September of 2000 the recommendation setting out the problems with using the guides which are designed to assess impairment in adults for children. I mean, some of this just seems self-evident. For example, how would you assess a six-year-old's ability in the workplace? It's unintelligible. We needed some other system to do it. Also, I'm looking around the room here and I'm seeing uh, people that are well aware of the fact that children grow into their brain injuries. A four-year-old may assess relatively uh, minor in terms of impairments from a brain injury, but, and I, I know a lot of people here know this, they, they will evolve such that it's going to be a very serious brain injury as they age with catastrophic uh, results and a catastrophic impairment. This section allows the assessor to extrapolate into the future, look at those developmental consequences, and in effect just declare them as cat. Let's talk for a minute about the threshold. We'll go back to section 2 sub 3. When I was looking at uh, this section, it came to me that just because somebody is under the age of 16 uh, at the time of the accident, you don't automatically get the opportunity to apply the special considerations. Let's see what 3 says. It says that 
the special considerations you can apply, i.e. developmental implications, they apply if the person's under 16, that seems fine, no problem there, and that, I'm just carrying on, and at, excuse me a second, I've got the, subsection four applies if an insured person is under the age of 16 at the time of the accident, and none of the Glasgow Coma Scale, the Glasgow Outcome Scale, or the American Medical Association Guides to the Evaluation of Permanent Impairment can be applied by reason of the age of the insured person. In other words, if you're doing this assessment and the person is 15 years of age, you just can't automatically go and say, because they're under the age of 16, I can use these developmental implications. Section three says there's a threshold. The assessor has to set out the reasons why the guides can't be applied. And I think I've seen many uh, pediatric assessments where that's not been done. The assessors are just assuming that because the person is under the age of 16, the special considerations set out in section 2-4 apply. I think it's a flaw and I think you have to make sure if you're going to use the special considerations that you set it out. It may seem quite obvious with a, a child of two or three years of age, but when you start getting into the later years, 13, 14, 15, I think that any conclusions can be attacked if you don't set out uh, those reasons. Let's carry on now to an interesting phrase in uh, section 2.4 of the special considerations and take a look at the phrase that says, that can reasonably be believed. It states that if it can be reasonably believed to be a catastrophic impairment, it should be deemed to be catastrophic. This is something that only applies in regards to uh, 60, under 16 catastrophic assessments. When one looks at the guides for adults, we see the phrase in accordance with the guides. The guides are looking for precision and accuracy and certainty when it comes to adults. However, this language is quite, uh, pr uh, quite precise in that I believe that if the assessor holds the reasonable belief that it's catastrophic, it's quite possible when one gets before an arbitrator or a judge on a disputed catastrophic assessment that the judge or the arbitrator may have to determine not if they think the person has the catastrophic assessment, but if the prior assessor, if their belief was reasonable, then they've followed the legislation and they have to uphold that reasonable belief that it was a catastrophic impairment and should uphold the deeming by the assessor of that. One of the things that uh, I noticed quite quickly when I decided to do this uh, topic was that we've had this, uh, these special considerations now uh, for going on eight years and the Financial Services Commission and the superintendent of insurance have provided no guidelines whatsoever on how these special considerations are to be applied. Uh, they've given us no uh, procedure and they've given us no protocol. All right, that's fine. Uh, we'll go and have a look at what uh, the courts and the arbitrators have had to say about these sections and applying them and the protocol and procedure that's supposed to be applied uh, in using them. Uh, I felt like Gomer Pyle in a way was surprise, 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 not one single decision whatsoever. And I found that very shocking, I, I, just because surely we've had disputes over the last eight years as to whether or not some infant is catastrophically impaired. And I'm just interested in, in myself, and maybe I'll talk to some of you during the break as to how this is possible. I know I've got one uh, going uh, before Fisco now. One of the, uh, so basically when you're reading these uh, sections, your ideas on the proper interpretation would be very useful to me. So let me know if, if uh, people have been doing these assessments and what they've been doing. One of the issues is what is the appropriate point in time for the assessment? We want to use these special considerations. We want to think about the developmental implications. We are all quite aware of the fact that the uh, 
insured will typically hire an assessment team sometime for a multidisciplinary assessment and they'll be doing that say for a child who is 13 and they will apply these sections and they'll make a determination that the child is in fact catastrophically impaired and they submit that to the insurer. The insurer then says we want to have our own section 45 examinations and it too is a multidisciplinary uh, examination and of course now with the $2,000 limit they seem to take so long to do it because they can't find anybody to do it unless you drive all the way to Winnipeg. Um, <laughs> And that can take eight to 10 months for them to do it. So what are those assessors supposed to be doing? This is now the insurance company's assessors. Are they supposed to be determining whether or not the infant has a catastrophic impairment, taking into account the developmental implications at the time they're doing the assessment? Or are they to determine whether or not the insured's assessors you know, whether or not they were correct in having that reasonable belief that they did. Well, we don't know the answer to that, but carry on. Suppose their assessors say, no, not catastrophic. Now we have to go to either court or arbitration. It's taking Fisco now about 10 months just to acknowledge that you've sent them a mediation application, so it's not unusual to end up before a court or an arbitrator two years after you've done your initial assessment. What is that arbitrator supposed to do at that point, especially if the child's now 17? Uh, are they supposed to make a determination on whether or not the insured's team's assessment were correct in having their reasonable belief at that point in time of the future developmental implications? Maybe it's when the insured, the insurer, the insurer did its assessment. Maybe it's when you're actually at the arbitration. Maybe the arbitrator's supposed to make his own findings and his reasonable belief. Uh, in other words, we truly don't know, and, and it really is a bit of the Wild West out there. Let's talk about the burden of proof for a moment. Um, we're talking about future developmental implications. So that involves crystal balling. When you're doing these assessments or when you're part of an assessment team, try and stay away from phrases like maybe. Maybe is maybe, not, not good for lawyers. We, we don't like hearing that. Um, because maybe the laws of physics will change tonight and the Earth will go spinning off into the galaxy and no longer orbit the sun. It's not likely, and that's the phrase we want. Uh, your, your, your findings on future developmental implications, uh, use the phrase likely. You hear lawyers say things like more probable than not. That sounds just too lawyer even for me. Uh, but the, the phrase likely, I think, is, is what we need. There's a possibility there's a lesser burden of proof of substantial likelihood, but when you're doing these, I'm, I'm satisfied that if you use the phrase that these future developmental, developmental implications are likely to happen, that uh, we'll, we'll be able to use that successfully at any dispute. Let's take a few examples about, uh, I've spoken to uh, many of the uh, experts that are doing these assessments and it was interesting, they all had different approaches on how they would go about doing it. But uh, imagine that a child, uh, an infant, a pre-verbal infant is injured in a car accident. Uh, the ambulance attendant arrives. It's not as if he can sort of assess the child's Glasgow coma scale if they can't talk, because that's uh, the whole Glasgow coma scale presumes that somebody is verbal. But if the assessor reviewing the other injuries uh, and evidence that's available believes that, and again, reasonably be believed to be the catastrophic impairment, equivalent to a Glasgow coma scale of nine or less, then that assessor would just simply fill in the OCF 19 and say, Glasgow coma scale, nine or, nine or less. And that's how uh, one of the assessors uh, does it. Uh, another example would be a 10-year-old child who has a Glasgow coma scale reading of 12. Uh, one of the assessors told me uh, that uh, in uh, his belief, uh, children uh, can suffer very serious brain injuries, but they don't have the same difficulties responding to the verbal stimulation test of a GCS that adults do. 
So a very badly brain injured child may in fact have a GCS of 12, uh, but um, because of the developmental implications, some assessors are using that as a basis for just uh, signing the OCF-19 as a GCS of nine or less. Let's talk about maybe a, a test which would be uh, designed to a 55% whole person impairment finding of catastrophic impairment. You've got a teenager with very bad orthopedic injuries, but they're not going to make the 55% threshold using the guides on that. But the child's growth plates, or the bone plates, have, have not yet completed uh, finishing their growth. And the assessor knows that it's very foreseeable that with these injuries, when the child does finish growing, they're going to be seriously disabled and, and permanently impaired. If the assessor is of the view that these impairments are such that taking into effect the developmental implications of the orthopedic injury is such that they're catastrophically impaired, he just ticks the 55% WPI box. Let's talk now about an example for a chapter 14 marked impairment. Keep in mind, another way to be catastrophic under chapter 14 of the guides is whether or not you have a, a, a marked impairment or extreme impairment in the four domains which they define for adults as activities of daily living, social functioning, concentration, persistence, and pace. And the fourth one, adaptation, deterioration, or decompensation in work or a work-like setting. It's kind of difficult to assess a 12-year-old or a 13-year-old's ability to uh, adapt in the work or work-like setting. That's a typical example illustrating there how we need these special consideration sections for uh, a pediatric uh, catastrophic assessment. In that situation, if the assessor is of the view that the mental and behavioral disorder is such that the child has a marked impairment, the assessor would just simply state that on the OCF-19 supporting report and carry on. One of the things that I think we should touch on briefly is, uh, again, uncertainty. You know, the lawyers are talking. Um, the fact is that we don't know if we can combine the psychological with the physical at this point in the exercise of taking into account future developmental implications. You want to take into account future developmental implications, but having done that, if you find, for example, if you're trying to go to the 55% level, maybe presently you're finding a 30% present, then some future developmental orthopedic injuries that brings you up to say 45%. And then you want to take into account what you perceive are going to be the future uh, mental and behavioral uh, developmental consequences. And you want to assign say a 19% to that. Now, we're, still we're stuck now with what Darcy was talking about a minute ago, and that's the uncertainty between Desbian and Kuzner's. Can we or can we not combine those? So be aware of that uncertainty. Um, the, uh, Lee Samus uh, for the defense argued that case, and he told me that it's going up to the divisional court uh, in mid-November. November. So hopefully we'll uh, have uh, an answer to you on that shortly and uh, stay tuned uh, to the website. Um, thank you very much.